Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, we transitioned from the world of mythology into the earliest stage of what can truly be called Medina history with the rule of Andre Manello, the first king of Imerina. Or was he? You see, you could make a pretty good argument that while Andrea Manello may have ruled first, that it was his son who created the majority of the institutions and structures that would form the basis of the Marina Kingdom, and therefore is the true deserver of the title, First King of Imerina. In this episode, let's learn about the eventful life of Ralambo, who might not have been the first Marina King, but was responsible for the creation of the Merina Kingdom. Season 4, Episode 5 Ralambo, the Miracle Child As we mentioned in the last episode, dating events in the early Merina Kingdom is rather difficult. While the majority of scholars agree that Andrea Manello was a real historical figure who ruled sometime in the 16th century, that's still a century-long window. As a consequence, his death date is also uncertain. 1575 is the most popular guess for the time of his passing, but it's just that, a guess. Similarly, the birth date of his son, Ralambo, is also a mystery. However, while we don't know the details of when he was born, the story surrounding the birth of this future king is certainly fascinating. The arrival of a new child into the world is always a stressful time, but according to the Tantara Niandriana, the circumstances surrounding Ralambo's birth were especially tense. While Andrea Manello and his wife had conceived six prior times, four of these children had been either stillborn or miscarried. Two young boys managed to survive into infanthood, only to die during the botched circumcision performed by their father. So, despite being the sixth time his mother was pregnant, if he survived the birth, Ralambo would be an only child. His parents were, understandably, quite paranoid that their seventh child would meet a similar tragedy before his birth, so they went out of their way to try to ensure that he received safe passage into the world. His mother consulted with a group of Fasimba oracles on how she could protect her unborn child and guarantee that he was given a chance at life. The seers informed her that she should move outside of Alasora to rest before she went into labor. In a small village on the outskirts of town, she went into labor on the first day of the new year, and miraculously, her son survived. As the mother sat, resting with her newborn, she noticed a wild hog, or lambo in Malgasi, lying dead outside of the house. Perhaps feeling like this dead animal must have had some relation to her son's survival, his mother named him after the beast, Ralambo, translating something like Lord Hog or Mr. Pig. Ralambo's birthday on the new year which the Malgasi lunar calendar places in the first month of the year al Mahdi, would go on to become one of the most prominent public holidays in the Marina Kingdom. If you'd like to learn more about al Mahdi Bey, or how New Year's was celebrated in the Marina Kingdom more generally, then you can watch our new premium episode on the topic by supporting the show at patreon.com slash historyofafrica. You can also support us if you want to listen to the show ad-free, listen to exclusive behind-the-scenes content, or if you just want to help us keep putting out this free educational program. And to those already supporting the show, thank you. Now, apart from this likely apocryphal legend, the early childhood of King Ralambo is largely enigmatic. From what little we can gather, the impression we have of Ralambo is that the young prince enjoyed a coddled but suffocating childhood. From an early age, Ralambo was afforded little if any agency or responsibility in his life. Despite the fact that, as we'll see, it became commonplace for Marina princes to play a major role in their parents' government, there was never any reference to Erlambo being entrusted to lead a battle or administer any part of the state during his father's reign. And honestly, this isn't all that surprising. Given the ill fates of his many brothers and sisters, it's certainly understandable that Andrea Manello was a little overprotective of his only living son. Erlambo's only responsibility was an unfortunate one to carry on the family dynasty through a reluctant marriage to his inbred cousin slash cousin once removed, the daughter of his aunt and cousin who he was forced to wed. When his father eventually passed around 1575, the succession of Ralambo to become the next king of Alasora went smoothly, 
with no serious internal challenges to his rule. After all, his father had gone out of his way to ensure that the only true candidates who could challenge his power, the family of his brother Andrea Malanitani, were now married into the same line of succession that passed through Rolambo. Regardless, his sheltered upbringing ensured that Rolambo was completely out of his depths. Rolambo's father never gave him a chance to learn or understand the intricacy of ruling even a village, much less an entire kingdom. No, Rolambo was kind of thrown to the sharks. It was now his responsibility to learn how to govern on the fly. While this lack of experience may have been a challenge in his early years, though, I think we'll see that, in some regards, it might have worked to his benefit. Like his father, laying out an exact chronology for the life of Rolambo is difficult, as the majority of sources which describe his life do not concern themselves so much with the order or context of events, and instead act as isolated snapshots of his various accomplishments, reforms, and anecdotes attributed to him more generally. So, constructing a biography for the man is quite difficult, and honestly resembles more of a disjointed collection of stories than an actual overarching life story. Despite the lack of chronology, though, some constantly present themes within these retellings allow us to connect the biography of Ralambo into something resembling a cohesive understanding. Given that his father had never provided him opportunities to practice leadership prior to being thrown into the position of king, it shouldn't be surprising that Ralambo's philosophy of how to run the burgeoning Alasora state varied dramatically from that of his father. After all, while Andrea Manello might have instructed his son in his philosophy of rulership, he had never allowed Ralambo to truly dip his toes into leadership and become accustomed to it. It's kind of like, in a game of football, you have an old veteran quarterback who gave his young backup all sorts of advice, like, here's what you do in this situation, and here's what you do when this happens, but never lets the kid actually touch the ball during practice. So, when it came to this period of rulership, Rolambo largely had to wing it. As a result, Rolambo went his own way, and turned away from many elements of his father's governing philosophy. One of the major themes of Andrea Manello's reign was the attempt to rectify a feud with his brother, which of course ended in his brother's violent death, and a promise to his mother that the brother's line would one day inherit the kingdom. The solution was to set up a very incestuous series of marriage arrangements, in which Andrea Manello's sister married his nephew, and then their daughter married Rolambo. And keep in mind, this whole ordeal took place in a culture where incest is just as taboo as it is in most of the world today. It wouldn't surprise you, then, to hear that Rolambo's arranged marriage to his cousin-slash-cousin-once-removed, a woman named Rafotsito Hinamanjaka, was not necessarily a passionate one. Now, there's nothing that shows that he had anything against her as a person, and the two did have a pair of sons together, but it's clear that Rolambo had no genuine romantic passion for his cousin. With that in mind, it's not surprising, then, that one of the first things he did, after his father's passing, was immediately look for a new wife. Now, divorce was a common and accepted practice in Malgasy society, even in the 16th century, but that option wasn't really on the table. After all, the notion that Andrea Manantani's family line would one day inherit the kingship, passed down through Lalambo's cousin-wife, was a crucial pillar in reconciling the potential anger stemming from the old prince's assassination. To solve this dilemma, that is, to be able to marry someone he actually had passion for, and to maintain the political obligations of his marriage to his cousin, Rolambo came up with the solution, polygamy. Prior to the rule of Rolambo, marriage in the Malgasy Highlands was strictly monogamous, which was quite unusual. Like many elements of Malgasy culture, the norms of marriage are a product of the mixing of Austronesian and African cultures. Polygamy was common in the cultures of the western and eastern coasts of Madagascar, where Bantu cultural influence was more prevalent. Meanwhile, while many Austronesian cultures also practiced polygamy, the main Dayak group which settled Madagascar was, for the most part, monogamous. As a result, the Highlander cultures were more strictly monogamous than their coastal counterparts. Rolambo, despite the presentness of this cultural norm, saw himself as an eligible bachelor whether he was married or not. According to the Tantara, Rolambo's desire for a new romantic partner was no secret and, if anything, basically public knowledge, and it is within this context that one of the best-known stories involving Rolambo takes place. On an otherwise ordinary day, a royal servant was out strolling when he encountered a group of young women. 
All of the ladies were quite pretty, but one of them stood out for her particularly good looks. A woman named Rafozzi Maro Bafina. The servant, knowing that Rolambo was on the hunt for a baddie, ran back to the king and asked if he should propose to the beauty on Rolambo's behalf. Rolambo was like, yeah, and the servant quickly ran back and approached Rafozzi Maro Bafina and asked if she would be interested in meeting the king. Knowing that the king was married, she said no. Rafozzi Maro Bafina was not interested in being a concubine or side piece, and made this clear. When Rolambo ordered the servant to propose again, the lady stated that she would only marry Rolambo on the condition that she was treated as a full queen, to be a fully respected and fully privileged member of the royal family. Additionally, Rolambo would have to treat their wedding as if it was his first marriage, a whole event featuring the proper gift-giving and celebration. Likely against her expectations, Rolambo agreed, and to make matters even smoother, apparently Rolambo's first wife was perfectly fine with her husband getting hitched. After all, she likely had no romantic passion for her cousin either, so if he wants to find someone that he's actually interested in, uh, good for him, I guess. Just like that, the two were married. Rather than causing an uproar in the public, as you may expect, the marriage of Rolambo to his second wife permanently transformed the Heinland Hofa's conception of marriage. While monogamy remained the more standard, default form of marriage, especially among working people, Polygamy became a normalized and eventually widespread practice among the elite classes of royals and nobility. Polygamy would also bring a fair number of challenges for Malgasy society after its immediate introduction, though. Namely, the practice of polygamy dramatically increases the number of descendants that a single man can feasibly produce. This is especially troublesome when being descended from a given man is a crucial element of political power. You know, like in a hereditary monarchy. If too many people with relations to the monarch are out there, it can lead to succession disputes, or also concerningly, can result in giving out a glut of titles and artificial offices in an effort to soothe the anger of those potentially rebellious claimants. After all, each member of the royal family is going to be expecting to receive some position of authority in their life, so the natural response when there aren't enough titles to go around is to invent some. This can work for a while, but over time, title inflation can result in inefficiency and ambiguity in who should be doing which civic task in which jurisdiction. Rolambo, demonstrating a great deal of foresight, knew that the problem of title inflation would begin to run rampant if he had a large number of descendants. In fact, the problem would be even more severe in his case, given that his children would be classified as coming from multiple lineages. After all, it was the lineage of his wife the granddaughter of Andrea Malanitani, that gave his children the legitimacy to rule, not his. He needed to create a system which differentiated and clarified the social role played by his future descendants and their own children as well. And that's not even to mention the role that would be played by the children of his aunts and uncles. I mean, how distant of a relative is distant enough to not warrant social privileges and titles? If some random uncle comes wandering out of the woods and demands a title and land, how much, if any, should he receive? And what about a second cousin? Or third cousin once removed? It's kind of like when you win the lottery and all of a sudden your entire family wants to get to know you. Would Rolambo's descendants end up like winners of the lottery, with obscure family members they've never met before oozing out of the woodwork looking for favors? Now, under his father's rule, all of these groups were socially conflated as Andreana, or nobles. These relatives were given often arbitrary areas of authority, typically a village or piece of countryside to govern, and maybe a plot of land in which they'd establish a new settlement. To prevent future ambiguity over who was responsible for which domains, Rolambo decreed the division of the Andreana class into multiple subclasses based on lineage, which much more strictly limited who was allowed within its ranks. To prevent future dynastic disputes, Rolambo subdivided his sons and daughters into multiple subclasses of nobility. For starters, there was the San Rolambo, or Sons of Rolambo. The San Rolambo consisted of the children that King Rolambo had with his other wives, not those had with his cousin. Despite being children of the king, these children were not direct descendants of his uncle, Andrea Malanitani, and therefore, by the rules of organized succession, were never allowed to consider seeing the throne. Members of the Sandra Lambo were confined to positions of local or bureaucratic authority, but never 
ever could one be king. The next two classes belonged to the lines of the two sons that Olambo had had with his cousin. The two sons were, through their mother, the great-grandsons of Andrea Malanitani, and were therefore each viewed as eligible heirs to the throne. By the rules of organized succession laid out by Rangita, the eldest son, a man by the name of Andrea Tompoco Indrinda, should inherit the throne after Ralambo. Meanwhile, the younger son by the name of Andrea Jaca should produce the next heir. Now, we won't touch on why in this episode, but suffice it to say that this system of inheritance will undergo major revisions by the conclusion of Ralambo's rule. But for now, each of these sons was designated as the progenitor of a new line of nobility, with the line of Andrea Tampoco Indra being next in line to inherit the throne, while Andrea Jaca's line would produce all future monarchs. Finally, to square everything away, Ralambo designated all other nobility, that is to say his uncles, cousins, and other somewhat immediate relatives, as Andrea Dranando. They weren't direct descendants of Andrea Malanitani, so they would never be eligible to inherit the monarchy, and due to their lack of direct descent from Ralambo, this lineage did not enjoy the same level of prestige as the previously mentioned lines, but they were still given preferential social and economic status. One of the things that Rolambo sought to use his now streamlined system of nobility for was to execute a series of political and civic reforms. For starters, there was the matter of taxation, and, well, the lack thereof. While we've been talking a lot about kings and succession throughout this series so far, it's kind of hard to visualize what the kingdom of Alasora actually looked like on the ground level. And that makes a lot of sense when you consider that to an average person living in Highland Madagascar during the 16th century, it may have come as a surprise to them too that they were supposed to be living in a rapidly growing kingdom. During the rule of Andrea Manello, the communities living under him were governed by autonomous extended family structures called demes. Each deme might pay occasional tribute to the king at Alasora in exchange for protection, but this tribute payment was irregular and unreliable. Beside these tribute payments, the kingdom was largely absent from people's daily lives. The average Hofa farmer just did their own thing, harvesting rice and other crops, clearing their own land, and making their own tools and clothing. If someone felt that another member of their town had wronged them in some way, they could just turn to the elders of their daime, and they'd make sure everyone got justice. This system of decentralized government had its strengths and it had its weaknesses, with the biggest weakness by far being the lack of efficient taxation denying the central government from much of its potential revenue. Rolambo set out to solve this problem by creating a new localized power structure to supersede the authority of the local demes. He divided his kingdom into numerous plots of land, called menekeli. The menekeli, usually translated to as fief or duchy, were then assigned to various andreana, who were supposed to rule over the local people, enforce the king's laws, raise manpower in times of war, and, most importantly, enforce a new head tax, through which everyone in the Menakeli was charged a flat sum of money or resources in exchange for the king's protection. Additionally, the people in the land would be subject to a system of Fanampuana, or conscript labor. In the Fanampuana system, Hofa and enslaved workers were occasionally drafted to build large projects, sometimes local projects on behalf of their Andreana, or sometimes as part of a large, coordinated draft to work on royal projects. These new systems of centralized taxation and conscript labor came to the enormous detriment of the working classes. Taking workers off farms often resulted in their families undergoing a period of intense poverty, and when the worker came back from their period of fanampuana, a significant portion of their income was still snatched by the local nobility in exchange for this vague notion of protection. On the other hand, it did allow for more concerted uses of collective wealth and labor. Throughout Merina history, any state project, one as small as a local well, or as large as a wall or castle, was driven by the force of Fanampuana labor behind its creation. As if reforms to the financial and governmental system of his kingdom weren't impactful enough, Ralambo also sought to transform the way that his kingdom maintained its legitimacy. Now, Rolambo himself had just placed a lot of responsibility of daily governance, and therefore a great deal of material power, into the hands of his relatives. While this had worked as intended when it came to centralizing power and authority, it also highlighted the precarious situation of the Alasora kingdom. 
While his father had sought to balance the authority within Alasora on the ground of familial relations, Rolambo knew that such a system was fragile. Even though he was theoretically the one in charge, what could he do if, say, his relatives turned on him and stopped supplying him with men and material? He'd be completely helpless. Rolambo needed some sort of way to ensure the loyalty of his subjects, whether they be Andriana or Hofa. His solution to this problem was to make use of a peculiar Malgasy cultural artifact, known as Sampi. Malgasy traditional religion heavily relies on a concept called Hasina. Hasina is a type of supernatural virtue, which all people are born with, but can also weaken or strengthen through a person's actions, inheritance from their ancestors, or transference from one person to another. It is often compared by outsiders to the ideal of a soul, life essence, or karma, though it does have its own interesting quirks in the beliefs surrounding it, which make these comparisons a little bit flawed. Sampi, on the other hand, are sort of like Hasina outlets for a local community. Consisting of a physical idol crafted from a mixture of natural and man-made material, Sampi allow the people from the village to tap into the universal essence of Hasina, which they would then repay by making offerings to the appropriate spirits. Hasina could be drawn from the Sampi directly into a nearby person, or it could be stored in smaller amulets called Odi, which functioned kind of like rechargeable Hasina batteries, and allowed the wearer to carry a small amount of Hasina from the Sampi with them wherever they go. According to the Tantara, one day a mysterious woman from south of Alasora's frontiers came to the capital city. Going by the name Kalobe, she carried with her a curious metallic object wrapped in banana leaves. Upon arriving in the city of Alasora, she met with King Ralambo and informed her of her reasons for coming north. Her hometown had burnt to the ground, and all she had been able to rescue from the fire was the village's sacred Sampi. In exchange for granting her amnesty in this kingdom, she offered not only to give the object's power to Ralambo, but to even serve as its official caretaker. Ralambo, intrigued by the woman's offer, allowed Kalobe to enter his lands. She settled in a small town called Ambohima Nambola, where a sacred shrine was soon erected to contain the venerated Sampi. This Sampi, known as Kelimalasa, or the renowned basket, consisted of two small wooden beams fused together, wrapped in a silken textile, and then covered with various items of silver jewelry. The presence of the Sampi immediately provoked the interest of local people. Residents of nearby towns flocked to Ambohinambola just to get a mere glimpse of the supernatural object. Men and women alike made pilgrimage to the town to learn from Kalobe on how they too could help take care of the Sampi. And, most importantly, Rolambo noticed it all. Whether he was a true believer in the power of the Sampi, or whether he simply spied opportunity, or perhaps a bit of both, Rolambo leaned into the growing religious movement around Kelimalasa and other Sampi. He ordered for the requisition and gathering of a series of similarly venerated objects from villages around Alasora's countryside, keeping them in a substantial royal collection. Rolambo's goal behind integrating the Sampi into the royal system of governance is clear. By associating the Sampi with the institution of the king, Rolambo provided the position with a new supernatural mystique. The king was no longer merely a position of secular power, but was instead a title which carried with it great religious importance and intense spiritual strength. Rolambo was also careful to allow only trusted associates to maintain positions of authority relating to the Sampi. As vesting the spiritual authority in a stranger could incidentally end up undermining the royal association to the venerated objects. This meant that Kalobe, whose personage was too strongly associated with Kelimalasa, was now seen as an obstacle to Rolambo's plan to turn the position of king into a religious leader. Depending on which version of oral tradition you take more seriously, she was either banished, assassinated, or imprisoned leaving Rolambo as the highest spiritual authority in Emerina. Now, disloyalty to the king could be met with threats of supernatural character. If an Andriana within his fief was being a little bit cagey with his willingness to pay taxes, then the Sampi would clearly not receive enough offerings, and the sun will not rise tomorrow. If you are perhaps having thoughts about leading a rebellion against the king, the spirits will be angry that you disobeyed the keeper of their vessels, and there will obviously be a deadly drought. With his collection of Sampi established, 
Rolambo finally had a force of legitimacy that went beyond the ever-treacherous realm of familial politics. As if the thorough reform of the system of government in Imerina wasn't enough, Rolambo's myriad achievements do not end here either. He is credited with numerous innovations, rituals, and cultural practices. Most famously, he is often credited with ending the tradition of living solely on the milk of cattle that had once been practiced by the Fasimba. The Tantara claims that, one day, Ralambo and a group of compatriots decided to offer the body of a cow as a burnt sacrifice to a spirit. Inhaling the delicious smell of beef, Ralambo decided to make the risky choice to eat a piece of meat from the sacred animal, much to the shock and horror of his companions. When the initial shock wore off, Ralambo, smacking his lips from his delicious snack, persuaded his companions to try the beef as well, and, in one fell swoop, he ended a centuries-long cultural prohibition of consuming cattle meat. Of all his reforms and innovations, though, by far the most iconic change of his rule was the introduction of a new national identity to the people of his kingdom in highland Madagascar. With full hindsight, Rolambo's rule has a continuous theme which permeates many of his decisions. Whether he was centralizing government authority under his Andriana relatives, undermining the power of local demes, or promoting an ideology of consolidated religious power under the king, Rolambo's reforms each contributed to the transformation of his kingdom from a collection of autonomous villages under the protection of a shared king into a state where the king and his allies exercised true governmental authority. In short, his lands were no longer many kingdoms under one man, but one kingdom under one man. Fittingly, Rolambo decided that a new collective identity would be necessary to encompass and unite his new subjects, especially as he introduced ever-increasing material distinctions between his noble and peasant pawns. Given that the towns of his country were mostly built at the peak of hills, he settled on the name Imerina, or the land of conspicuous places. His subjects were no longer just Hofa or Andriana, they were Merina. With that said, I want to add some caution and stress the fact that the idea of a Merina nation varied substantially from the way that most people view nations today. Merina was, and still is somewhat to this day, more of a cultural identity than an ethnic one. According to interviews with multiple Andriana families in the early 20th century, any Malgasi person could become Merina by living the lifestyle of the highland rice-cultivating people, though foreigners from outside of the island could not. And as we'll see, the existence of a Merina identity at all took its time to rise to prominence. While Rolambo declared that his people were Merina, cross-cultural, class-based identity remained the most common form of identification in daily life. In early modern Merina, if you stopped a random person on the road and asked, what are you, they would probably answer Hofa or Andriana before they came up with Merina. Regardless, the creation of the Merina identity is a major step in the history not only of Imerina, but in Madagascar as a whole. And speaking in Madagascar as a whole, the latter half of Rolambo's rule would see the king swamped in various military conflict with larger, stronger, and more technologically advanced kingdoms from other parts of the island. But before we can get into Rolambo's war, I think it's time for us to take a quick break from the ongoing story of Rolambo's time in power, and learn more about his soon-to-be rivals. What was going on in the rest of Madagascar during the rise of Imerina? Join us in our next episode, as we explore the rise of the first true empire in Malgasi history, one which dwarfed the Merina kingdom in power and prestige for the next century, the Kingdom of Sakalava. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then we would love it if you could support the show. You can do this through supporting us monetarily at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing the show with a rating or a view on whichever platform you listen on, or sharing the show with anyone who you think might be interested in learning more about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayofagwamie, Morgan Blackmore, Sarah Penza, Dimitri, Emmanuel Zaudi, Alexander Travis, B.B. Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Travis Bell, Johnny Knowles, Godfrey Sebalabie, Diz R.H., Evan Edwards, Pascal Nwokocha, Joe Maxwell, Nkechi Nwabodike, Sheyuno Lerontimain, Kwacho Amankwa, Douglas Harder, Craig Bolton, and Samuel Badu, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really, really means a lot.